Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art. Hi, I'm Jumani Anami, and from the studios at South Florida PBS, this is Artloft. Welcome back, Art Lofters. I hope you're enjoying our adventures so far this season. And for those of you that are new to the program, get ready to be hooked. Now, in this episode of Art Loft, we are heading to the great outdoors for an up-close look at some open-air sculpture projects. First up is the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens in West Palm Beach. This enchanting wonderland of large-scale works showcases the sculptures of this talented and prolific 20th century artist. So sit back and relax as we learn more about Ann Norton's outstanding career. as an artist was visionary. I think she was unique because she was inspired not only by um, the techniques, the materials, and, and what she learned about creating her work, but the people she knew, where she traveled, where she came from. It all comes together with a very spiritual quality that connects landscape, nature and art. It was two years before Anne passed away that she decided she wanted to create a legacy for this community, a place that, that created a sanctuary for enjoyment by visitors um, from all over the world. Well, the gardens is a bit of a mystery tour, which is really wonderful. Uh, so that people can really feel when they go into the gardens that they've gone into a magical tropical jungle in a way. There are ponds, there are Anne's nine major monumental sculptures that are in place and there are four, four to five galleries inside the house in the rooms. It is a large uh, collection of rare species of palms and of uh, other tropical plants. In fact, one of the largest in the country. So people can explore and we have taken the time to label a lot of the trees. It's an educational experience as well as a pleasurable one. A number of her sculptures were made of plaster, a lot of them in fact. Uh, but there are some bronzes as well and of course the wood. When we come to her sketches, uh, she worked a lot in, um, in charcoal and in pastel. And in the house, we do show some of her sketches uh, that were kind of pre-sketches to her work, to her sculptures. And she used a lot of color. And she worked in some very interesting materials. As we've said, she was a lover of nature and she took the best materials from nature that she thought would be appropriate for her work. And as you will see, the uh, northern cedar that she uses reflects also some of the uh, Native American totems. Those materials were used, that kind of wood was used for that. Uh, she's very spiritual about her work and uh, she would take these kinds of um, materials that com complement uh, the ideas that lie behind the, the subject matter that she chose to create. We're standing in front of gateway number one, which is so symbolic of what Anne wanted to communicate with her work. She called this the window to the soul. The key here is the influences that uh, Anne Norton had. Uh, the Eastern influences, the spiritual influences. We think there is some Mayan influence here too, and also the influences of her mind. In 1977, the house was open to the public. It became <clears throat> uh, registered on the National Register of Historic Places, 
And since then, uh, every effort has been made to include the community and to educate. Uh, thousands of school children come through these doors and through the gardens every year. And that's a very, very important part of the legacy that Anne left. Uh, the Anne Norton Sculpture Gardens and Anne Norton herself um, is something of a treasure here in West Palm Beach. And in South Florida, it is rare to find a house, a studio where the artist lived and worked and where her work still is in position here today. Anne made a remarkable contribution to the world of modern art. Um, and her vision and legacy here reflect so much of her interest in travel, the exploration of Eastern philosophy, um, the, the very intuitive spiritual qualities that um, she enjoyed. Coming up on Art Loft. And I just started making glass. And my work looks so different from anybody else's glass work because I'm completely untrained. I was doing things that later I was told you couldn't do. And now I'm traveling the world teaching these methods of glass making that we've developed. For nearly four decades, Susan Zelkin and her late husband, Paul Hawkins, gained recognition as pioneers of alabaster sculpting. They are known for hand gathering the rarest of colored and translucent alabaster from the deserts of the American Southwest. Their sculptures honor the shape and beauty of each stone they collected. Arizona PBS brings us this soft, translucent, colorful, and flowing profile. We are in the shadow of Squaw Peak, which is the exact center of Arizona and we're on the edge of the Verde Wilderness. So we live in this very magnificent, expansive corner of the planet uh, where we can make a lot of noise and a lot of dust and not bother anybody. I'm Susan Zalkind, and I have been a professional alabaster stone carver for almost 40 years. Really, my art has been about celebrating this material. I'm so fortunate to just bring out the beauty of the stone. The stone itself speaks. It has a color, a figure, a shape, translucency, and it begins the conversation. I want the world to be comforted by the beauty of this stone because alabaster really is a healing material. If you live with these pieces, if you hold them, your heart is open, you're comforted. I lift stone for a living. When I was washed on the shore of California dreaming in the early 70s, I had to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. It was certainly different from uh, two master's degrees and working at a mental health center in Boston. I am, and my husband was, and we were graced, gifted by finding our passion and being able to actually do it and make a living from it. This was something we shared that was bigger than we were. Finding and bringing out the beauty and the glory of the stone and sharing it with the world has been our shared passion. We fell in love with this area, the central mountains of Arizona, and Sedona and the Verde Valley. And we went sniffing around for alabaster. We were driving northeast of Tucson up the San Pedro River Valley. And boy, it sure felt like there was alabaster there. And we got out and we started, you know, poking around and with pry bars, tink, 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 you know, you know, thud, 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 tink, thud, 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 tink. And the tink was this magnificent white alabaster forming in bubbles just under the surface. Alabaster 
is the evaporate of the old inland seas. It's part of the geology of the planet. The minerals leach down through the stone to create the color. And so we found purples and reds and the oranges and the blacks and whites. I conceive of alabaster as petrified water because it shares the same qualities as water. It's soft, it's translucent, it's flowing. And that's what our pieces look like. They're soft, they're translucent, they're colorful, they're flowing. Basically, we transform this raw stone into vessels of beauty. And how do we do that? Well, we begin by hanging off cliffs, <laughs> hand gathering this rare colored and translucent and magnificent stone. People are attracted to the bowls and they are magnificent. And uh, our most popular item are the candle lamps. They'll go at anywhere. They're, they're elegant, they're gorgeous, they're luminous. They put a votive candle inside and they light up at night. Even a small one will glow a large room like you wouldn't believe. This is kind of a, a larger bowl, a candle lamp bowl that I carved. But this is the process that I pick out a raw stone and I take it first to the standing grinder and I hold it and I, I carve away the bark, the outside bark, and I, and I reveal its shape and I start shaping the outside of the piece. This is where I begin for the, the smaller bowls. You know, it can take weeks, it can take days, depending on the size of the stone, and that's just the outside. And once I know where the outside is, then I can start carving away the inside. And um, once I've carved a lot of the inside and the outside is almost there, I can start refining with um, smaller grinding discs till the shape is refined, refined, refined. And you just keep on refining until the outside is completely shaped and the inside is completely shaped. And then everything is hand sanded. My husband was a production engineer, and so um, he really adapted and developed tools that had never been used on this stone that, that have created pieces that the world's never seen before, from large to very tiny, like using dental tools to carve the roses. These tools had never been applied on this stone before. Uh, always percussive tools had been used on it, which are the wrong tools for this delicate material. But with the right tools, a delicacy has been achieved that the world didn't know was possible before. We've created all of these genres, hundreds of genres, flowers and landscapes and inlays and, and doodly squats and faces and all these genres really. Uh, where do, you know, what do I want to make today? Really, it, it, there are so many possibilities always out there. This is a material that has been beloved for thousands of years by hundreds of cultures. The freedom that we experience from carving this stone from exploring it, hey, I can do this, hey, I can do this, hey, well, what do you think of this? That's good, I think I'll, I'll do this, watch me. You know, it was like we were playing aesthetic leapfrog and in the adventure of our lives, which was exploring this magnificent material and the possibilities of ourselves. Bet you can't carve a rose, oh yeah? Coming up on Art Loft. It's this live thing, it's got water. It dries out, you put it in the kiln. That process sets me up for all kinds of experimentation because there's this part where you have to give it up to the kiln. Painter, gardener, sculptor, innovator. Self-taught artist Craig Mitchell Smith began making glass works simply because he wanted more beauty in his life. 
Interestingly enough, despite his high level of skill, he still doesn't even call himself an artist. So maybe we'll just call him a creativiteur. Okay, I made that up, but check it out for yourself, then tweet me and let me know what you would call him. So thanks to Cleveland's WVIZ PBS Idea Stream, get ready to be in awe. I had always loved making things. My joy has always come from making things, but I could never label those things art. I just could see it in my head of what I wanted for my garden that didn't exist. And so I just started, I borrowed the money for the kiln and I just started making glass. And my work looks so different from anybody else's glass work because I'm completely untrained. I was doing things that later I was told you couldn't do. And now I'm traveling the world teaching these methods of glass making that we've developed. Uninhibited by his lack of experience, Craig Mitchell Smith developed a technique of molding glass into three-dimensional shapes. The technique I have, I don't know that it really has a name yet. I used to be a painter. I was a theatrical set designer. I did a lot of restoration paint work. And so I think like a painter. So what I knew to do once I got a kiln was I started cutting glass in the shape of brush strokes. I buy chemically compatible glass that can be melted together and I cut them in the shape of brush strokes and then I imagine that the bottom of my kiln is a canvas and I draw with shards of glass on the floor of my kiln. <laughs> and then I fire them to about 1,500 degrees and it liquefies the glass, melts together and it slowly cools it. So then I end up with a flat piece of glass, but I want those pieces to be three-dimensional and curved. So then I look at each piece of glass and I imagine it, it comes in a flat form and I imagine the shape I want it to have, and then I take stainless steel and I bend it or find curves of stainless steel and I form topography in the bottom of the kiln and I balance the glass piece on top of it and when I fire it a second time, the glass gets just warm enough to lose its strength and it collapses onto the curves which it takes on itself. One of the things I love about glass is I'm a language guy and it's a metaphor for me for the human condition. It is malleable when it's warm, it's brittle when it's cold, at its best it is transparent and brilliantly colorful. Those are all the things I, I think we can strive to be as people. Smith's passion for gardening and flowers is rooted in his childhood. My inspiration has always come from nature. Ever since I was a little boy, uh, I spent my time in nature trying to understand and be part of what I see around me. I'm still living in a garden that I started to plant when I was a child. So I am um, a nurturer, all gardeners. I am a gardener at heart. And all gardeners are people who tend things. So this is a natural expression of the, of the beauty I see uh, in nature around me, is the, the, the basis of my personal joy. Each one of Greg Mitchell Smith's large glass flowers is put together on site, and they can be a bit tricky to assemble. This is when you're most likely to crack the glass. When you drill glass, it has to be kept wet to both lubricate it and cool it. Through a couple of years of experimentation, I learned how to bolt the glass together uh, with cushy fittings in between them. Uh, and we learned how to put the glass together in a way that's durable and holds up through these winters. Drill this last hole and then this one as Craig Mitchell Smith goes about planting and pruning his glass flowers, he hopes that visitors will be inspired to stop by each of the 10 gardens at Stan Hewitt and smell the roses. Our goal is these pieces are um, beautiful and they're sited exactly where I wanted them to go. I'm trying to get people to see the gardens in a new way and we've uh, situated all the pieces so that there are beautiful photographic opportunities with the house always as the background. One of my favorites of course are the poppies. I love doing those 
insanely happy looking uh, orangey red poppies on their twisting copper stems just rising out of the magnificent flower beds adding a color that uh, right now the beds are filled with purple and lavender and you've got the shock of orange but later on in the season more of the flowers are orange and red and gold so uh, what I'm trying to do is give people a reason to come back and see the gardens anew they're very beautiful gardens and they're very different spring summer and fall next week on Art Loft. It's made with these scales that are mica, and then they have uh, sandwiched in between them either butterfly wings or bits of trash, all different colors. Um, and there are 60,000 pieces, and they're sewn all on a sewing machine. Martha Russo is a sculptor and installation artist who hopes her mysterious objects and forms will inspire the childlike curiosity you once knew. Or perhaps if you like me, you never let go of. Here's a story from Rocky Mountain PBS. Give it a mix. Because of the nature of the way the ceramics material works, you make it, it's this live thing, it's got water, it dries out, you put it in the kiln. That process sets me up for all kinds of experimentation because there's this part where you have to give it up to the kiln and you have to see what happens and then react to it. And there'll be a time when, when I'm working and my concept is not gonna come alive with ceramic materials. It's gonna come alive with metals or fruit and pig intestine and all sorts of resins and epoxies. But I use them in the same sort of spirit that I use the ceramic materials. You said ceramics, fruit, and pig intestine all in the same <laughs> Where is the intersection of ceramics, fruit, and paint testing? So you know, when I got to grad school, everybody was super fancy, talking about postmodernism, and I was just lost, and I was terrified when people would ask me, what are you making, why are you making it, why are you doing this? I had no idea, I just knew I liked to make stuff. So my husband said, don't think about all that stuff, just trust your gut. And so I really actually started making stomachs. And so basically, I'll make this little blue stomach. This is how I feel when I'm in seminars and I have to give a blurb about my work. And it's gnarly. And here's a little pink stomach. When I'm done, I feel more calm. I just made a million stomachs. One of my professors, she was like, why don't you use real guts? So that's where the pig intestine came in. So I went to a butcher and I got a hank, it's called, of pig intestine, which is eight strands of 10 foot long. It comes in this bag of salt water and the, and the um, pig intestines are around a, a little plastic ring so they don't get tangled. And so I came home and I thought, okay, I'll start fooling around with them with fruit, just seeing how the material reacted. And it was just like, it's just like clay in lots of ways because you, you take it, it's got a water content to it. I would wrap it around, my favorite thing were mangoes. And then in the morning, I come back out and now it's shrunk and now you can see the scale of the pig intestine and they're all different. So I was completely hooked and I loved it because the fruit over time it would slowly start to decay and it would change. And I liked it too because every day it was different and I had something different to look at. So that's the long story of pig intestine and fruit. <laughs> what I'm most interested in is objects to activate space, to make people feel slightly uncomfortable. That psychological line between, you know, what happens when there's a whole mass of objects in one space and they're bigger than you are. That makes you feel very, very different than opening up a drawer and you have some little objects that, you know, that's the size of your, your fingernail. And so I love playing with that kind of line. I've been thinking much, much more about that immersive sort of quality of like having someone enter a space and have it, not necessarily physically be around it, but psychologically it envelops you in different ways. 
I'm really interested in how objects and objects in space or just space can activate places from what you've grown up with, what you've surrounded yourself with, what's been important to you, what scares you. If my work can activate those kinds of feelings and thoughts, then all of a sudden we're at a place where people are telling each other things. And we're at a place where we're like kids again. And we're not, we're not saying, oh, that's that and this is that. And, and that's why I purposely, purposely make my work just on the edge of you cannot quite have a, a word for it. I'm trying to make it so there is a place where you don't have the language and now you're back to your original senses and you're trying to figure this thing out for the first time. Purposeful obscurity. Thanks for joining us on Art Loft. Connect with us anytime on social media at Art Loft SFL. And watch us anytime on the PBS app by selecting WPBT2 as your local station. For Art Loft, I'm Jamani Anamdi. And remember, art imitates life, so live a beautiful life. Peace. Funding for Art Loft was made possible by Friends of Art.